You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow a side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews. So let's get started. Welcome back to the show. This is Nikayla, and this is episode 33 of Side Hustle Pro. I am super excited to get into today's episode with a woman I admire and respect a great deal, Christina Brown of lovebrownsugar.com. Before we get into the episode, quick message from our sponsor. Support for this podcast is brought to you by Master the Gram. Master the Gram is the ultimate Instagram course for business owners who want to attract their true fans and turn them into loyal, returning customers. In a series of four modules, plus a bonus module, you will learn how to leverage Instagram to grow your brand, drive traffic to your site, and increase your income. To register, visit sidehustlepro.co forward slash master the gram. Now let's get into it. Today in the guest chair, we have style blogger and digital media expert, Christina S. Brown, founder of the fast growing style and beauty destination, lovebrownsugar.com, mommy destination, babybrownsugar.com, and digital empowerment community, Brown Girls Love, not to mention shop Love Brown Sugar. She has been recognized everywhere from the New York Times to People Style Watch as a top lifestyle expert and is known for curating platforms for multicultural women with an emphasis on self-empowerment. Christina has been heralded as a 30 under 30 style maven by HelloBeautiful.com, a top 40 style blogger by Essence Magazine, a Black Enterprise Blogger Month honoree, and a Wharton Magazine social media watch list honoree. So welcome to the show, Christina. Tell us more about who you are and what you do. Yeah. So um, so like you mentioned, my main site and what most people know me for is Love Brown Sugar. Um, so it's a style and beauty site that's geared towards women of color. And um, it I really started it out of a, a need um, and necessity that I saw. Um, I wanted to see more positive representations of women of color in the media and um, I saw that there was a huge lack of that. Um, I, I was surrounded by all these amazing women of color who are doing big things and who are absolutely beautiful, setting trends and just, you know, just doing so much. And I just didn't see that um, in the media, in magazines, or on TV or anything. So I said, well, why don't I try and use my own platform to show more people, you know, that we that we are beautiful, that we are confident and that, you know, we have a lot more going on to us than just looks. Um, so that was basically the premise behind Love Brown Sugar. And since it's, it's grown to so many different places, I have different platforms now. And so one of the main things I'm working on right now is really expanding my brand and uh, making sure that people know um, the different the different things that I do and, and how they, they differ from each other. Because I think that um, is one of the th- areas that I could grow a little bit more as far as educating people on, you know, Love Brown Sugar is for this, Baby Brown Sugar is for that, Brown Girls Love is for that. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of what this year is about. 2017 is a year of expansion for me. <laughs> oh yes, oh yes. Now <laughs> let's. I always like to take it back, right? So how do mm-hmm. you think your upbringing influenced your entrepreneurial drive? Yeah, it's so funny. I was raised by two working parents, and so um, both my parents worked nine to five jobs. Um, never really had um, kind of an entrepreneur to, to look up to. Um, when I was younger, for the most part, um, my parents were working regular jobs and they still work regular nine to five jobs. Um, but that said, they were always super passionate and it's interesting. They always had side hustles as well. So both my parents um, were caterers when I was younger. And, um, I remember there was a time that their catering business was so, um, booming and, and, and they were getting so many requests that they really had to make a decision between, okay, are we going to keep this um, catering business going and like leave our jobs and do this full time? Or are we going to keep our jobs? And, you know, ultimately the decision was based on our family situation to, um, to, you know, to keep their full time jobs because that was more stable. But I do remember growing up and seeing that and seeing that they had all these other amazing talents um, that they, you know, would try to expand on, but obviously couldn't expand past a certain point because of the stability necessary to raise, you know, our household had four kids. So, you know, just thinking about that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, but my parents worked incredibly hard and they instilled that in me. And I think that's a big piece of why I've been so successful. 
That's so interesting. You know, it, it's you started out by saying, actually, you know, I wasn't really around. But then you're like, but wait a second. They did have side hustles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that yep. definitely, I'm sure, seeped into your brain and and mm -hmm. had something to do with this this side hustling spirit that you have. So tell us about some of the first steps you took when you were starting out with Love Brown Sugar. Like, I remember when it was just a blog on Blogger. Um <laughs> What were yep, the first all those years ago? Yeah, all those years ago. And mm -hmm. when did you start taking it from idea to brand? And what were the shifts you made when you did that? Yep. Um, that's a good question. It definitely was a step by step process for me. Um, like most people who start their blogs, you know, who started blogs back then, I would say, I didn't go into it with the intention of building a business around it or making money from it. I went into it as this is something that I see could be really positive. I also was looking to work in editorial and I didn't have any formal editorial experience. So I also was using my blog as a portfolio for myself so that when I went out and sent my resume out to try and get magazine jobs that they would, could take a look at my writing skills on my blog. So it served a few different purposes back then, but all hobbies for the most part. Um, and so the process from, you know, going from being a, a full-time, uh, uh, sorry, a, just a blogger who was doing it as a hobby to being a full-time blogger, um, it took a few years. And so I would say the first four years of my, um, my, you know, blog, I was just doing it as a hobby. And around maybe three years in 2012 is when I started to t make a little bit of money from it. And I was like, oh, okay, this could be, you know, something cool. Still just keeping it to a side hustle because definitely not matching up to what I make in my full-time job. And it wasn't until early 2013 when I really had to make the decision. Like I, I either am going to be a really horrible full-time employee because my blog is now taking up so much more of my time and I'm getting so many more opportunities from this, or I'm going to, you know, scrap the blog, keep it a hobby and get back to being more serious about my full-time job. And at the time, you know, I did like my full-time job. I didn't love it. I liked it. Um, but I loved my blog so much more. <laughs> I was just like, this is an amazing tool. It gave me all this instant gratification. It was a way for me to empower people immediately with just writing a few sentences, posting a few pictures. I was like, I love that I'm able to interact with these people and do all this stuff. So let me kind of take a leap and see where it lands me. Cause I'm like, I'm young. This is kind of the only time that I can really do this. I have no responsibilities outside of making sure I have a roof over my head. So, <laughs> so that was my rationale. And, um, I, I don't want people to confuse my um, journey with thinking that I just kind of jumped into working on my blog full time. I did have some sort of a plan before I left my job. Um, I was making sure to put money aside. I, I had a little bit saved up. And um, and also before I left my job full time, I had set up a consulting agreement um, with some of the, with one of the companies that I was working with um, just to make sure that I had like monthly income, you know, and I wasn't kind of left cold and dry with no <laughs> money to keep things going. So um, it was a process, but I, I did some planning. I didn't jump. I didn't just jump right into it. Got it. Yeah. That, I'm glad you yeah. mentioned that because that was, you know, my next question. I always want to know mm -hmm. how people prepared, yep. you know, for entrepreneurship. Like what were the financial steps you took? So it sounded like, you know, you had an agreement, you'd save, you had a little pot and you made the leap. Mm -hmm. So you were now, now you're full-time on your own kind of like love brown mm -hmm. sugar. How are mm -hmm. you marketing and building awareness and, and especially in like a oversaturated market? How are you distinguishing yep. yourself? Yeah, it's interesting. Even back then when I quit my job, it was 2013. That's when blogging kind of started really taking off. And when people started to realize like you can actually make money from this. And I think it's around that time that the industry got super saturated, like tons of new blogs popping up left and right. And um, as far as marketing and promotion, I have always been a big fan of being myself, being unique and being transparent. And I think that's what um, people kind of gravitated towards me. And what people loved about me is that I wasn't out there trying to be somebody else. I wasn't, you know, replicating some of the other bloggers who were doing, you know, their own thing. I just had my own thing. You know what I mean? I, I have curves. Um, I have brown skin. I, you know, I love wedges. I love <laughs> Cara print, like, you know what I mean? I have my own things that I love. And so people who love those things as well, they would kind of gravitate towards me. 
And I think that's like the biggest piece of advice I give any blogger that's, you know, trying to um, build up their own personal brand or, or create a business out of this is just be you. Because at the end of the day, there's really no competition when you are just being yourself because you're the only you're the only one of you on this earth. You know what I mean? So any talents or skills that you have, people that you know, you know, um, you have like a very specific uh, purpose to fulfill. And so I just feel like if people are reminded of that, there's less of the whole competition and there's less of a need for them to like, you know, market themselves so much. Like you kind of become your own marketing machine because you're just being authentically you and people gravitate towards the things that you do and what you love. So, um, so yeah, I, I would say I definitely am big on making sure that people know who I am. I always have my business cards with me and, you know, I would go out to networking events and, and, and get my name out there, but I just, I focused on just being myself mm -hmm. and I think that's very important. Yeah, I wholeheartedly believe in that as well. Um, you mm -hmm. know, instead of overthinking it, sometimes you just have to share your journey and mm -hmm. put yourself out there but put put in the things you want to put out there like obviously you don't have to right. sacrifice all your privacy to, right to right. get people to follow you mm -hmm. um but speaking of the marketing and the brand building now i i didn't originally have this as one of the questions but i'm interested to know nowadays like how can you make a living as a blogger what are the revenue mm -hmm. streams that are um just most effective these days because I, you know, ad banners and things like that. That's not really, that's not really cutting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's a great question. And, and it's so timely because it now is a time that we're seeing a lot of different um, influencers. And I, I will say influencers because there's a lot of people outside of just blogging that kind of have influence on different platforms. I, we see these people who are creating different income and business streams and it's awesome and inspiring. Um, so I, I actually hosted an event last weekend called Brown Girls Love Power Day. And um, I had some really amazing panelists on board and we did one panel discussion called Your Influence Your Way. And so I had these different women on who um, traditionally were bloggers or social media influencers and were able to create either businesses or different income streams or follow their passions just by way of like using, you know, their influence to get there. And so for me personally, I, um, I have a few different things that I do in addition to offering like sponsored opportunities on my website. Um, I also do a lot of brand ambassadorships. So a brand will want to tap me based on who I am and how well what I put out there fits into their messaging and um, basically tap me to, to kind of join forces with them to get the word out about campaigns that they're doing. And so for that particular revenue stream, you know, I, I'm very particular about brands I partner up with for ambassadorships because I want to make sure, obviously, that my brand, my um, my audience trusts me and that I'm only aligning with brands that make sense for who I am. Um and so that's one revenue stream. I also obviously host events, like I mentioned before, the Power Day event I did um, last last week. Um, and then I do speaking engagements. Um, I also do consulting. Brand consulting is a big piece of my business. And so because I've built up a specific audience and I know who that audience is and what they like, a brand might tap me to to um, help them, you know, launch a new product line or to help them, you know, launch something in a new market that I know a lot of because of um, having my blog and having my platforms. So. Um, so, yeah, I think there's there's so many different ways people can make money from this now. And it's really awesome and inspiring because you can kind of take whatever you've done um, with your social community and kind of transform that into something that makes money for you. Interesting. So. For mm -hmm. people who are listening who are just starting out, maybe they're three years into the blogging game, but haven't yep. reached that level of influence in terms of, um, you know, um, vanity metrics or anything like that, but mm -hmm. they have an engaged community. What would you tell them? How do they approach a sponsor or um, pitch themselves for these brand ambassadorships? Yeah, I I think. And, and this is something that people are slowly kind of adapting to. When I say people, I say like the people that behind those brands mm -hmm. are slowly coming to understand that it's not always a numbers game anymore. Um, you know, I don't have the most followers as some of the some of the other influencers out here. I don't have millions of followers. Um, you know, I'm closer in the thousands and um, I, I'm still able to make a good living doing this because, um, like I said before, I am uniquely me and I focus on partnering with brands that fall 
um, very closely in line with what I support. So for any new um, bloggers or influencers out there that are looking to, you know, partner with um, really amazing brands, focus on um, who you are and make sure that um, you're forging relationships with brands that fall in line with what you do. Also, focus on engaging your community. So, you know, obviously you want to continue to grow your community and for more people to follow you. But for the few people that do follow you right now, make sure you're having constant conversations with them. You know, reply back to them on social media, follow them. Um, you know, just make sure that you're kind of in the mix and that your audience gets you and you get your audience. Because I am much more, um, you know, as a as a brand, for example, I would be much more inclined to partner with someone who can give me like real metrics on you know, the types of things that my audience purchases or, you know, um, the types of uh, products that they like, as opposed to someone who has a ton of followers, but doesn't really know who they service, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or has all these followers because they're super popular. But when they say, hey, go purchase this, nobody actually listens. Right. So I think that's the big thing um, on that same panel I was talking about. I talked about the difference between popularity and influence. Popularity means that you're super popular. Lots of people follow you. And, um, you know, you might have had a viral video or you might be, you know, Beyonce's cousin or something like that. <laughs> and so people care about you because of that. But that doesn't mean they trust your opinion. When you have influence, people trust your opinion and they make purchase decisions and life decisions based on something that you're doing. So I think as a smaller kind of up and coming, you know, blogger, influencer, you should focus on building up your influence, not just your popularity. Indeed. I so agree with that. You know, the other day, and I can relate to this so much, and it's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on here, not only because, mm -hmm. um, you know, for those of you who don't know, Christina is one of the people who, uh, you know, I had a really pivotal conversation with before I started pursuing. <laughs> yeah, like I went to her Brown yeah. Girls Love Day in DC in 2015. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, I had to sign up for a VIP, even though I know Christina, yeah. I paid for my <laughs> VIP ticket. I said, I want, <laughs> yes. I want my one-on-one -on -one time with Christina because I truly respect <laughs> the process and the fact that you have built up this business. Just really admire mm -hmm. you. And um, Thank you. I have so much <laughs> love and respect for you. So I, I paid for my VIP time and I sat down and, mm -hmm. you know, the conversation we had about how I can really get back into blogging and and building up my personal brand to that day really stuck with me. That was a turning point for me. So one of the things that mm -hmm. I, I'm thinking about as you're talking about this is like, I was building up my media kit the other day. And as I'm like pulling numbers, you know, you always start to like compare yourself to people. You're like, ah, mm -hmm. who am I going to pitch? But then I really looked at the community I'm building and how, how, mm -hmm how much this information and this content is valued. And I'm like, I don't even, I don't even really care about what this media kit says. Of course I'll do it just for, you know, having its sake. But how do you feel right. about that? Like when you were first starting out, were you just like sending your media kit out there or after a while, did it become you forming personal relationships and the conversation starting yeah. from there? Yeah. So in, in the beginning, especially when I first quit my full time job, it was very much me trying to get myself out there and let brands know, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is who I am. Do you want to partner? Um, because another thing that I, I don't mention often, but I got pregnant with my daughter just a few, like maybe a month after I had quit my full time job. And so, mind you, I, you know, I'm just losing my benefits. Like mm. I'm losing, like having that steady paycheck. And so all these things are happening at the same time. And I was just like, listen, I have to get serious about monetizing this business. Um, so, yes, initially I sent my stuff out a lot to different brands to see who wanted to partner. Um, and now I'm blessed in that, you know, I've worked so hard and, and have been so diligent that people come to me and I don't really have to pitch myself as much anymore. But um, um, but I think that in the beginning, you know, I wish I had been a little bit more intentional about the types of, of brands and, and, and people that I was reaching out to. It's great now because lots of people know me and know who I am and know the type of things that I do. Um, but I would have probably cut out a lot of work and like hours of emailing and phone calling if I was more strategic <laughs> about the, the people that I wanted to reach out to based on relationships that I already had. So mm. I really feel like it should be relationship first. Yes. You know what I mean? Like if there's a brand you're already, you know, wearing all the time or already very supportive of because of your own reasons, just start to kind of um, 
form that relationship and and engage with those people, you know, as much as possible to kind of build that up. There's no guarantee, obviously, that if you form a relationship with a brand that they're going to support you later on. But it's just a good practice. Um, and I think you shouldn't hold yourself back from pitching to, to lots of people because I'll, I'll say this, I might pitch to, you know, 20 people back then and only two would respond. <laughs> so it is like it is kind of a numbers game. But I think if you're doing things right, you know, people will kind of come to you and will gravitate towards you based on your genuine intentions and and your in your community. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. speaking of uh, becoming a mom, it, it's funny you mentioned that because I thought you were like uh, two years full time already a, as an entrepreneur before Cadence. No. Came wow. I didn't know that. So <laughs> no, she came along and popped up right after. I said, I'm about to have this first baby, which is my business. And now I have a second baby. Wow. Second. It was crazy. See, yeah. Even more reason why I have so much respect for you. So how, how and when did you start to actually reap profit and rewards from your business Mm -hmm. and then what were the first things you invested back into the business yeah that's a good question um it's funny I I am one of those people that I'm very big on making sure that I'm investing in my business on a consistent basis um and I would say almost to my detriment (laughs) I am now in you know, late 2016, early 2017, just getting like a financial advisor to step in and say, okay, this is how much you need to be spending on this. And this is what you need to hold back on and things like that. Because I'm just like, I'm about growth. You know what I mean? Like, all right, if I have to spend this money to make sure this looks good, to make sure this is done with excellence, then I'm going to do it. And I'm one of those people um, who, you know, mistakenly would just pay myself last. Like, okay, let me pay this person and that person so I can make sure this looks good. And then whatever's left over, I'll just take the scraps. And so now I'm in a place where I'm like, okay, I have to switch this strategy around a little bit because that's not long-term sustainable. And I also need to be making smart um, kind of investments in business decisions. So um, I, to your original question, I think it depends on the type of business you have, um, how much and the, and what type of investment you need to make. But for me as a blogger, you know, influencer who's very big on um, making sure that that I look good in front of the public, I would make investments like great photography, um, graphic design, um, you know, makeup and hair if I'm doing an appearance. Like those are the types of things that I would have to make investments in because I always wanted to make sure I put my my best face forward um, as a style lifestyle influencer and someone who is, I consider a curator, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? And so people needed to look at my brand and see some sort of excellence when it came to images, video, things like that. Um, So that's where I put a lot of my upfront investment. But if you're a food blogger, for example, you might want to invest in really, really great, you know, um, you know, plates or whatever that is that makes your stuff look really, really good. Um, You know, it just kind of depends on on what you're doing. Right. But um, for me, it was definitely images and video and kind of creative direction. Got it. And, you know, within reason, y'all, like, you don't need yep. to be freshly yep. made up beat every day. <laughs> <laughs> Only for you know, appearances. I'm not like Beyonce every day. Like, let's do that maybe like, once a week. Like, rain, it, rain it in because uh, because no it's a real thing like sometimes especially I, mu- I must imagine as a style blogger that you feel you have to look mm-hmm. good all the time you end up spending mm-hmm. money when it's like wait a second wait a second like be strategic yeah let me scale back yeah. right exactly but, um, now- and I would say you should also tap into just another quick point you should also tap into any resources that you that you already have you know what I mean you have a best friend who does makeup and hair or whatever, hit them up and say, girl, when I start popping, I'm bringing you with me. You know what I mean? Like barter your services, find ways to strategically partner with people so that you're not spending a ton of money um, up front. Exactly. And now I want to shift a little bit into expanding Mm -hmm. and what you've done. So you've expanded I love the fact that you're always continuing to grow your brand. Like, so baby brown sugar came along as a natural extension mm-hmm. of becoming a mom. Um, mm-hmm. What what was your vision there when creating it? Yeah, it's so funny. I really, baby brown sugar was just an organic extension of my love brown sugar brand. Because I, when I got pregnant with my daughter, I was like, you know, I want to find a way to kind of tell this story. And I didn't see many platforms out there that are specifically geared towards moms of color. Um, and, and 
the difference between I would say my baby brown sugar platform and, and, and some other mommy blogs is that it wasn't just stories from me. So it wasn't just my personal story that I was telling people about how I'm raising my daughter. My purpose for starting that was so that other people could come in and, and have valid voices on that platform. So it's kind of an overall storytelling platform for multicultural moms. And um, it, it was organic for me. Like people loved it because it was an opportunity for me to share my journey from being pregnant to finally having her, you know, the first few, you know, issues that I had with her breastfeeding, like all these different things that I was just like, I wish I had someone to talk about this every day. I can kind of put that stuff, um, you know, on the blog. So that was, that was a natural extension for me. And I would say every business that I've created since has come out of a need or come out of people asking me certain types of questions on a consistent basis. And I'm like, okay, I need to find an outlet for this because it's different from what I originally created and I don't want people to get confused. Uh So, um, so yeah, that, that's pretty much how it evolved. And then when it comes to things like events, we touched on financial stuff, but then when you're Mm -hmm. launching an event, like that's a lot of upfront money. How do you Mm -hmm. um, (laughs) plan for those kind of investments? Yes. So I would say the the biggest piece of what you just said is the plan part. Um, You do need to plan. And I have notoriously been one of those people like, oh, I want to have an event next next month. Let me just do it. And (laughs) that is not the way to go. You need more than 30 days if you want to plan a well-executed event. And so that's something that I've learned over time. The earlier in advance that you can plan, the better. You know, the more money that you can save up front before having to make that investment, the better. So, you know, it obviously will depend on the type of that you're doing, you know, how how full scale it is, if it's a smaller kind of more intimate person to person event or like a big expo, you know, it, it will really depend on um, on that, how, how much in advance you need to plan. Um, but I would say that if you if you want to do a really great event with excellence, you should start with a few basics, like, you know, the number of people who are coming. Um, what the purpose of the event is going to be. Is it going to be for networking or is it going to be an opportunity for someone to tell a story or to, um, you know, to tell their story? Um, you know, so those different types of events will kind of determine the the investment that you make up front. I could do a whole podcast on that. Just right. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I'm like, I need to hit you up, girl, yes. when I'm ready to p- start planning my first event. And then, and now yes. you've expanded into Shop Brown Sugar. Like, talk to us about yes. uh, Brown Girls Love first and then Shop Brown mm-hmm. Sugar. Like, then, yeah, how did you approach yes. those expansions? Yes. So Brown Girls Love... Um, which, you know, is just is just really at the core of my heart right now. I love it so much because because of what it represents. Right. So Brown Girls Love came because I started getting lots of questions when I quit my full time job. Um, I get questions from people like, oh, my God, you're able to you know, blog full time. How are you able to do that? Or, you know, you're you're so awesome doing all these things. And, and you know, you're inspiring me as a woman of color. But I really want to know about like finance. Can you tell me more about that? So I started getting questions like that. And I was just like, what if I could kind of create a platform that specifically addresses this and and also serves the need that I feel like is there? Um, For young women who were like me when I was in college and didn't really quite know what they wanted to do, but they had an idea that they wanted to eventually maybe own a business or, you know, start have their own personal brand, but have no idea like what to do to get there. And so that was the purpose of me starting Brown Girls Love, not just to be like a really fun Instagram page with 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 dope pictures of, of women of color, but also offline to be um, an opportunity for women to network for me to present some of my friends who are experts in different fields and have them talk, you know, about exactly um, what they do and and how they do it. And also an opportunity for people to learn and to grow. Um, And so that's, that's how Brown Girls Love was started. And it just has taken off over the past, what, two and a half, three years that it's been around. Um, And so with Shop Love Brown Sugar, um, that actually came about because I, I personally had, all these are really amazing um, black owned brands. So minority owned brands, I'll say um, that I loved and that I wanted to basically um, present my audience with options during the holiday season to shop some of these brands. And I didn't find them kind of all in one place because they were my picks basically. And so two years ago, I started a a physical kind of pop-up shop in New York City. I do it for one day and I'd invite my readers to come out and shop and support some of these brands. 
And people loved it so much, but the overarching kind of feedback I would get is, I'm not based in New York City. Can you bring this to my city? Or, you know, why can't you do it in Atlanta or Detroit or like wherever, you know, my readers were, they asked me to bring it there. And I'm like, girl, you know how much money this costs? Like, <laughs> <laughs> this is a lot of investment for me to put, you know, to, to get a space and to, to do everything with excellence, which is a big piece of what I try to do. It, it was a lot of upfront investment. So I said, you know, I, I can't take this on tour right now, but let me figure something out. And so this year, instead of doing the pop-up shop, I said, why don't I just do this online. You know what I mean? Why don't I launch e-commerce? Um, I had actually um, interned in retail when I was in college and I was I had my heart set on being a buyer at a, at a luxury uh, retail corporation and it just didn't end up working out because of the recession. And so I always had my heart set on having my own boutique, but I never knew how exactly that was going to happen. And so when this opportunity came around and I, I noticed that people really loved the things I was picking out, I was like, why don't I just kind of um, do this online and see how people react to it. And I'm just blown away by the amount of support that I've gotten over the past um, month, really. It launched at the end of November in 2016. And I got like over 150 orders within the first month. And, you know, things were selling out in days. Like, it just was awesome. I got featured on Teen Vogue and, and all these Essence and all these amazing platforms. So um, it just was definitely like kind of something that I was passionate about. And then I just listened to my readers and I heard what they said and I, I responded and it was successful. And I'm just like beyond excited. Wow, congrats. <laughs> it went well. So Thank you. this leads me to the next obvious question, which is how are you doing all this? How, what is the team, <laughs> that structure that you have behind you? And, and what's been yes. your approach to hiring staff? Yes, that's a that's a good question. So I'll say this. I am still figuring this thing out. Um, I don't want people to assume that because I have all these different platforms and they look great on social media and, you know, they look great when I'm talking about them. I'm still figuring things out on a day to day basis. And I think that's the beauty of entrepreneurship and something that you have to kind of embrace when you start your own business is that, you know, you're never going to have it all together or know everything about your business. It's a step by step process. Um, but when it comes to staffing, um, I have definitely gone through a lot of different staff changes since um, just working on my blog full time. Um, there are some people who helped me out on my team who have been there for years now, some that I've just started working with and are working amazingly well and everything is going well. So I think everyone's kind of approach to um, hiring people and hiring staff is going to be different. But for me, I always look for people who are really actually invested <laughs> in what I wanted, what I'm trying to do. Um, I look for people from my community. So I actually end up hiring a lot of people just, you know, I might put something out on social media and say, Hey, we're looking for writers or Hey, we're looking for an intern and people respond with their resumes. And I have at least half of my staff right now is based on people who applied, who were following my blog and who loved it and who decided to apply, um, you know, to be part of my team. So, um, yeah, a lot of my people come from my community. Um, I would say biggest piece, if you are a new business and this, I think this is one of the best investments you can make is investing in either like a virtual assistant or someone to handle your administration. Because when you start like actually getting to the flow of making money, you're going to have invoices that have to be submitted. You're going to be sending out like, you know, W-9s to all these different people and like having to follow up to make sure you get paid. Like all that stuff is is very hard to manage when you're trying to be creative and trying to you know be on the creative side of things. So I think that that should definitely be the first kind of investment that you make if you are making a staff investment is someone to help you with your overall administration. Now, yes. mind you, that <laughs> takes a bit of trust. Yes. Um, and how did you how did you yeah. figure out who to trust? Well, it's, it's funny. My mom handles my admin. <laughs> 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 so my mom is like a master administrator. She's like a director of administrator for. Um, so she's been uh, administrator for some really big companies, and now she works for a nonprofit. And so she's really good at that. And so I kind of tapped her to help me. Um, and so I lucked out, I think, <laughs> by having someone <laughs> yes. very close to me who could do that. But, um, but I think the trust factor is something that you kind of, kind of can develop over time. So you, you have to be able to give people kind of small pieces of things and then see how it evolves. Like, okay, this person is doing really, really well with this. Let me give them a little bit more responsibility. Um, also you set yourself up properly and officially with contracts. So you make sure that you have like a non-disclosure 
clauses in any, you know, contract that you set up with people and um, so that they can't kind of steal your ideas or steal your money or like steal <laughs> or steal things from you. So that's like the first thing is get a good lawyer to come up with a contract for you that um, will be a basis of everything that you do with people. And um, and then you just have those agreements so that you feel a little bit more safeguarded. Um, but yeah, there, there's I don't think there's a magic formula. I think it's something that people kind of have to um, try out and you're going to have people that don't work out that you end up having to, you know, X out from your, from your community or whatever, just yeah. because, um, and then you'll have people who work out, you know, amazingly well. So it, it's a trial and error situation for sure. Mm-hmm. I think I'm at that stage now because my inbox gives me anxiety and I'm like, I don't think yes! this is, I don't think this, I'm supposed to feel this way when I open up Gmail. So yeah. <laughs> yes. I am reading this book. Um, God, let me make sure that I get the right name for it. I think it's called Unsubscribe. Mm -hmm. I think that's the name of it. It has like a blue cover. It's one of those like newer um, pieces of work. But basically, it's all about like mailbox anxiety Mm -hmm. um, and like basically how to properly manage your inbox. And I am like, yeah, it is called Unsubscribe. The the author is Jocelyn K. Glee. So I need to read this. Yes. Yes. I am, I'm getting into that because I'm just like, this, this inbox has to get under control. Like <laughs> I cannot let it control me. You know what I mean? Right. right. Um, so that, it's a real thing. I, I understand what you're saying. It is. And I, I've mentioned it in a few episodes just because it's something that I haven't quite figured out how I want to, you know, move forward mm-hmm. with yet. So thank mm-hmm. you for that, you know, tip. No problem. Now, before we move into the lightning round, I'd love to know, how you are thinking about sustainability for the future for your business. So first, you know, firstly, how do you continue to financially sustain yourself given how mm-hmm. unpredictable entrepreneurship is? And especially as it relates to like health insurance and things like that, that um, you brought yep. up yourself, like being a mom, it, it's so much more critical. Yep, absolutely. Um, I think what I've learned over time is if you can get any type of longevity out of partnerships, um, consulting, ambassadorships, anything like that, try and do it. Um, That is really what has to sustain me the most. Um, I'm actually blessed in that this year I'm doing an ambassadorship that spans like an entire year. Um, So I think it's safe for me to announce it now because the it's coming out in a couple of weeks, but um, I've, I've actually partnered with Dove and I'm going to be in a commercial with them. Nice. Um, and I'm Congrats. super excited about that. Yeah. It's, it's for their, their beauty bar, which has been like a staple in my household for years now. So I was very excited to kind of partner with them um, on, you know, being a part of this, this campaign that they have coming out. But, um, but things like that, you know, that allow me the, the, the opportunity to work with brands on like a longer term basis um, really, I think, um, kind of helped set the foundation. And, and I mentioned this um, earlier on in the podcast about when I first left my job, setting up like a consulting situation um, so that I could, you know, make money for at least six months at a time. And, it, and I know that it's coming in every single month. So I think when it comes to, you know, automating things and making sure that you're getting consistent money, um, you want to forge relationships and work with people who will be willing to pay you over a certain amount of time, as opposed to just relying on one offs. That's what I relied on, I would say, for like the first two years of my business. And it was just very volatile. Like it was some months were amazing and other months were not so amazing. Mm -hmm. And that like gave me a lot of anxiety because I'm just like, I don't want it to be a situation where there's a month where I can't pay my bills or, you know, where certain costs are not covered. Um, so it does, it does take some discipline. It takes making sure that you look out for opportunities to, um, you know, make money over a certain period of time. And then also if you are in a space where, Hey, this month is really, really great. And next month is not going to be so great. You have to have that kind of budget set up and that self-discipline to know, okay, this month is really great, but I can't spend all of it. (laughs) I have to save some for next month because I can't go broke. So it, yeah, it's, it's a process, but, um, I think anything you can do long term is better. And what's been the most surprising aspect of being an entrepreneur? Surprising aspect is that I am not like sitting around working in my pajamas all day. I actually have to get up and do work. You know, it's funny. I could sit around in my pajamas all day, but that doesn't actually make me feel good. Like what makes me feel good is getting up 
you know, taking my shower, putting my little makeup on, you know, getting my hair ready. And then I feel like I'm in work mode. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think that's the biggest thing is that you think you're just going to be sitting around all day. And, you know, yes, I, I have my own schedule and I set my own everything. But at the end of the day, I do have like people that I report to. You know what I mean? Like I have uh, clients and, 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 th and that those are kind of my bosses. And then I have an audience on social media and they're kind of my bosses because they kind of direct some of the content that I have to put out and, and the times that I have to do that. So, you know, yes, you are your own boss, but you do have people that you're accountable to. And um, another thing I'll say is that I've worked harder. I work harder now than I ever did when I worked for somebody else. Um, and the difference now is that I just love what I'm doing so much that it doesn't necessarily always feel like work. You know what I mean? Like I'm on this call with you right now to most people, this is considered quote unquote work, yeah. but it doesn't <laughs> feel like work to me because I'm just kind of telling my story. So, um, so yeah, I think that's, that, that's what surprised me the most. I, I work harder now than I did before. Interesting. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. I, I can see that because I know when I leave for work every day, there's like 10 other things I wish I could have accomplished that morning. Mm -hmm. And I can only imagine mm -hmm. if I had the whole day just to focus on Side Hustle Pro. But, yep. you know, future, <laughs> the future is coming. Future. <laughs> let's, so, let's prophesy 2017 for that. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes. So let's jump into the lightning round. Um, so, you know, okay. the deal, you answer the first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? Yep. Alrighty. What's a resource that has helped you in your business that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? A resource that has helped me with my business, I would say FreshBooks. So um, I discovered FreshBooks maybe like a year and a half ago, and it really has changed my life um, because before I was kind of just invoicing people left and right, but FreshBooks is a system that kind of allows you to put everything in one place. And, um, and also it allows you to see when people have seen your invoice, I can see, you know, how much money I'm making every month. So that is definitely like a huge uh, resource for me that I think if you're interested in getting into consulting or, you know, just simply want to make sure that all, all of your financial stuff is in one place, that's like a really great resource. Awesome. Number mm -hmm. two, what's the best business book or podcast episode or even live event that you've consumed um, in the past mm. year? Oh my God, there's so many. That's so hard. Okay, so one thing I'll say um, for book, it's not really a business book. It's more like a self-help book. There's this book called You're a Badass. And um, I'm sure most of your readers, probably your audience probably knows um, My Leak and My Leak's uh, amazing podcast. Yes, yes. So I got, rec yeah, so she's awesome. I got a recommendation to read that book from her um, podcast and it has like changed my life. It, it's so awesome. Really? It really revolves around that whole idea of like the secret and like manifesting things and, and basically just knowing within yourself that you can do something. And then all of a sudden you, you do it because you, you believe you can. So it's just an awesome book. I recommend everybody to pick it up because it kind of changed my life last year. Yeah. I've been and meaning then, to read it. Yes. So that is okay. That's going to be the first book for yes. 2017. You got to read it. It's <laughs> so good. Have to. It will, it will set your whole year on fire. Like, Love seriously. it. Yes. I've been meaning, <laughs> it's, it's on my list. Okay. I'm, I'm putting it at the yes. top. Number, That's a big one. Yeah. Number <laughs> three, what is a daily practice you use to start your day on the right note and increase your productivity throughout the day? Um, so something that I do every morning is pray. Um, and that's something that I just don't, I don't ever skip it because it really helps set the tone for my day. Um, I'm a very spiritual person. I think I believe, and I know that God has, has blessed me with the talents that I have so that I can really fulfill my purpose. So it's important for me at the beginning of the day to be connected with him and to talk to him and to get direction. And so that's a big piece of what I do um, on a consistent basis. I try to um, do it for at least a half an hour, um, you know, just spend a little bit of time in meditation and praying. Sometimes it's longer depending on my mood, but I, I have started to get up early so that I can do that because I've noticed a difference in my day, you know, when I start with prayer and when I don't. Mm -hmm. What's another, <laughs> what's another personal habit that has helped you significantly in your business? Another personal habit that's helped me significantly, um, to-do lists. So um, there's, I actually use an app. It's called To Do, but it's spelled T-E-U-X, D-E-U-X. So it's like fancy to-do I know, I was about to say, you're fancy. fancy. <laughs> 
Yeah, so it's just a spelling that's fancy. That's really the only thing. Um, but um, but I like that app because um, it basically allows you to list out all the things that you have to do. You can kind of put them in categories. Um, and then it keeps track of them like every single day. So as you cross things off, they don't ever really kind of disappear. So I can go back, you know, and see some of the stuff that I've accomplished. And whatever you don't do for that current day kind of rolls over to the next day as well. So I really like the app. It's it's nice. It's easy to use and kind of helps me keep everything in one place. Got it. And I'll link to that in the show notes. All right. Yes. <laughs> so number five, what's your parting advice for fellow women entrepreneurs who want to be their own boss, but are worried about losing that steady paycheck? Hmm. Good one. I would say parting words, um, have faith. You know what I mean? And have faith is, is a big piece of it because at the end of the day, if you don't really believe that you can do something, then you're not going to do it. And it kind of goes back to that whole, what I was talking about earlier with the secret and that book and all of that. Like you have to believe in your heart, like I can do this. And then when, once that, that seed is planted and you actually put like the work towards it, it happens, you know? So I think that's the biggest piece. Um, and another thing that, that I, I, is one of my mantras um, moving forward is just start with love. You know what I mean? Just make sure that everything that you're doing, um, that you do it with passion um, and that is coming from a place of, you know, I love to do this and I know this is going to help people. Because anytime you do things um, based on your passion and what you really, really care about, um, you know, it the money just comes. And that's kind of what has happened with my business. Um, I, I've started different, you know, side hustles from my like original hustle. Um, and they all were born out of like a special place in my heart. And they somehow have have found a way back to funding me and, and allowing me to start new things. So I think that's a big piece of it. Start with love. Everything else will follow. Amen. That is an awesome note to end on. <laughs> so let us know what's the best way that we can connect with you after this episode. Um, everybody get your pens ready for Christina's multiple Instagram accounts and <laughs> emails. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god so many it's horrible yeah. um well i would say the main one is love brown sugar and i'm love brown sugar everywhere um and i i pretty much link to all of my different pages um from my love brown sugar pages so you can find me on love brown sugar um for for um anyone who's interested in empowerment women's empowerment um personal branding and entrepreneurship you can follow us on brown girls love and Brown Girls Love is only on Instagram, and we're we're just a, this year we're gonna roll out a Facebook page, um, but right now we're just on Instagram. And um, there's Baby Brown Sugar, which is everywhere. And um, Shop Love Brown Sugar doesn't have its own pages yet, so you can still kind of just follow us on Love Brown Sugar. But yeah, that's pretty much it. All right, <laughs> got it. Okay. So thank you so much, Christina, for joining us in the guest chair today. It has been a pleasure. Um, love the gems that you dropped. And yeah. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. <laughs> and there you have it. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to Side Hustle Pro. If you want to hear more from me, head on over to sidehustlepro.co forward slash side hustle corner to get my weekly side hustle diaries chronicles about my own journey from passion project to profitable business. And if you want to find me online, I'm at side hustle pro on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Don't forget to join the side hustle pro Facebook community. Go to side hustle forward slash mastermind. And as always, if you love the show, do me a favor and subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks, guys. Talk to you next week.